Hello, everyone, and welcome to Spring 2020 Social Entrepreneurship for Innovation in Health course. As you're aware, this course is part of Global Making More Health Initiative. The initiative explores innovative ways to improve access to healthcare for people, animal communities around the world. Through this course, participants connect to global cohort of health professionals from across private, public, and nonprofit sector. We all convene here to learn about entrepreneurial strategies to create best impact on social and businesses uh, in the health and wellness space. Today, before we start the session with Smita Satyani, who is our guest expert, I would like to first remind you that you must take the survey that you can see below the screen if you're watching us live, you get extra credit points for that. The second thing is we are difficulty, uh, we are facing some tech difficulties today, so there might be some disruptions, we are trying to make sure that, you know, uh, session does not get uh, impacted, but if it happens, we just, we may need to either reschedule or we may need to, uh, you know, wind up uh, earlier than we have planned. Our session today is going to focus on the theme of the module for this week, which is entrepreneurial challenges and opportunities. And that's exactly what we are going to be talking with Smita Satyani. Welcome, Smita. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you doing, Indrani? And uh, glad to meet everybody on the call today. Hopefully, um, I'll get some of your interesting questions towards the end of our chat. Yes. Smita, you are my ex-colleague from Ashoka, so I know about your work a little bit, but it will be great if you can tell us a little bit about your professional journey, starting from your academic background to what you're doing today. Sure. So I'll give you the, the quick version. Um, I, as Indrani mentioned, we met several years ago uh, as, when I worked for Ashoka, and I actually worked really closely with the Making More Health initiative for almost four years. So very excited to be back in a different capacity right now. And I'll tell you a little bit about my background and how I got to here. Uh, I was a, um, I'll, I guess I'll start with, with um, school. So I initially was a criminology major when I went to university and thought I was going to become a lawyer. Um, I decided, you know, I wanted to apply to law school. I took the LSAT. I thought that going the legal route was going to be the way that I could um, try and create the most social change. And it seemed to me like it was a path that was, you know, a vocational degree. It was a really concrete path where you knew, you know, what you would get out of it. And you knew you could get a really solid job. Um, and it would also be an incredible way to change existing structures that um, I thought were in many, in many ways unfair. So before I decided to actually uh, take the leap and go to law school, I did a three month summer internship in DC. And it was with, a, uh, it was with an organization that was a women's advocacy organization. And I just fell in love with DC. Uh, I loved the people there. There were so many incredible organizations, activists, labor groups, like folks that were really excited about the work that they were doing. And regardless of their political stance, felt very passionate about their work. So after those three months, you know, I had intended just to stay for the summer and I ended up staying in DC for almost 10 years. Um, oh. and, and my entire plan for, you know, go to, go to DC in the summer, do this internship, come back to uh, Los Angeles, which is where I grew up for the most part and apply to law school, completely changed. So um, after I worked at, on that internship, I spent a couple of years uh, working for a congresswoman from the Bay Area. I worked for a handful of nonprofits in the women's advocacy space. Um, I did a master's degree uh, in public policy, and then I worked for a handful of NGOs. So after that, I worked for the Clinton Foundation up in New York where I helped to run a, a mentoring program for women and minority small business owners. And that uh, led me to Ashoka. So I, I moved back to DC and worked at Ashoka for nearly four years. Um, it was an incredible opportunity. I was able to work inside an organization that was uh, just so far reaching. Um, I remember oftentimes we had phone calls with folks from all across the world that were working on social entrepreneurship issues and colleagues like Indrani and Isa and other folks that 
were calling in from all remote, remote parts of the world. Um, and I also got an opportunity to spend time with our local Ashoka offices on the ground. So spent time visiting our offices in Paris um, and you know in South Africa um, and spent time in New York. There was a lot of different engagement opportunities there in, in terms of being able to like see local work on the ground. Oftentimes, you know, you have a global organization that is based in a big city and doesn't really have um, connections or a deep understanding of what the local offices are struggling with or uh, working through. But I think Ashoka really allowed for that um, free flowing of information. And one of the things that was incredibly special about my time there is that I witnessed local offices really um, making leadership decisions and being empowered to run their own shops so the way that they felt best in terms of what was the, the best context for their own country. So that was like a, um, a very unique thing that I'd seen from a global organization and a reminder about how like entrepreneurship and being able to make your own decisions and uh, advocate for them was incredibly important and effective. So after my time at Ashoka, I went to, um, I had the incredible opportunity of being able to work for President Obama for the very last two years of his administration. And I'm not sure if anybody's heard of this program, but um, I helped to run a program called the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program, which was a program that brought in uh, external technologists and developers and designers um, into government for one year. And in that one year, they were tasked with trying to change the culture of a massive federal government agency in the United States. So we worked with all different types of federal government agencies. We worked with the Department of Education, um, the Department of Veterans Affairs, which is the largest healthcare um, uh, network in, in the world. Um, we worked with, um, you know, USDA agriculture. We worked with, um, you know, the State Department all across the board. So I did that for two years. And then at the very end of his administration, I decided it was time to leave, the D leave DC and I moved back to California, um, which is where I've been for almost four years now. And I'll tell you a little bit more about my work um, in our later slides that I've, I've designed for you all. But uh, I started working at X, which is the experimental labs of Google. We were formerly known as Google X um, almost four years ago and have been sitting on their public policy team ever since. Wow, that's incredible. My God, what a journey it was. Um, of course, we cannot wait to hear more about uh, you know, your work and the relevant uh, experience, but the floor is all yours to share your presentation. Awesome, okay, great. So let me um, share my screen and you guys can see a little bit of my talk. So can you all see that, Andrani? Okay, perfect. So um, I'll tell you all a little bit about what we do at X. Uh, like I mentioned, we are formerly known as Google X, which is a much more familiar name. And when Alphabet was formed as a, as a company, we dropped Google from our name. So now we just go by X. It can be a little bit confusing, I think, for people, but uh, I'll explain to you a little bit about what we do and um, some of the lessons that we've learned in our journey in the last several years of being our independent company um, that I think will help you all with your own entrepreneurship journey. So like I mentioned, our, our company has been around for a few years. It was actually our 10th anniversary this year. And as part of that, um, we, we pulled out some of the lessons that we've learned across various teams, both technical teams and central teams that help the technical projects succeed. And some of these are some, some of these are the lessons that we've learned that I'll share with you. And then I'll leave enough time for questions at the end because I want to hear what you all are thinking about um, and help answer any questions that you may have. So quick overview about X. We were created as the experimental labs of Google back in 2009 with the invention of the self-driving car project at Google. And the goal of the company was really to be a place where we could think 
10, 15, 20 years from now, um, how can we solve some of the biggest problems that the world is facing through technology? A lot of people ask us, um, how do you decide what are the types of projects that you work on? There are so many problems in the world that you could work on. So how do you prioritize that? So for us, we call ourselves, you know, the moonshot factory. Um, and our definition of a moonshot are the following things. And we definitely didn't uh, think of, you know, we didn't invent the term. The, the term moonshot came from President Kennedy when, you know, he was trying to put a man on the moon. But this is our definition of it. So we look at three different variables as we're thinking about how to vet projects and which projects decide to stay inside of X. Um, we look at it has to be a huge problem. So something that is impacting millions, if not billions of people. Um, we look at a radical solution. So something that is completely unheard of, um, maybe even science fiction sounding, and then a breakthrough technology. So it has to be either a hardware or software technology that is solving that, that big problem. So the majority of our projects really fall in the middle of those three concentric circles. And um, we use this as a way to really vet and make this, uh, help make uh, better decisions. This uh, rubric was, was designed by, like it was a crowdsourced sort of um, rubric that was designed by people inside of our company, um, not just the leadership, after really working on different projects for several years. And they settled on these three as a way to basically um, continue making hard decisions. So oftentimes people ask us, you know, why do you call it a factory? Why do you call it a moonshot factory? Um, for us, you know, like I mentioned, a moonshot is something that is a big, um, a, a big solution to a problem that affects millions of people. Uh, the word factory is really important to us. So a factory means something that is repeatable. Um, it's a process or a series of, of different pr innovation processes that can continuously be used to solve problems. So for us, we're not trying to just solve one problem with you know, self-driving cars. We're a place that is continually trying to solve problems and spin them out into their own companies. So uh, projects don't, say, don't stay inside of X for more than a, a few years. We like to have them be, uh, the idea has to come from X and we'll give, we'll give the project a team and resources and people to work on it. And then eventually a project will get to a point where it's ready for what we call graduation. And that means that they become their own separate project outside of X. So either they will become their own company um, inside of Alphabet or they'll graduate completely and take outside funding. However, the majority of projects actually end up getting killed is what we call it. Um, about over 99% of the things that we work on don't actually end up being projects that see the light of day. And it's designed, the process is designed intentionally to be like this. So a lot of times people ask us, you know, what is, how, what is the percentage of projects that really make it out? And we say maybe 1%, um, it maybe is even less than that. The amount of really silly, but, but, but potentially interesting projects that we think of at the earliest stage are, are um, a dime a dozen. So here are some of the projects that have actually graduated from X. And some of you all may recognize some of these names. Um, Verily, which is our life sciences work inside of, started inside of X. Waymo, which is a self-driving car company. Dandelion, which is a geothermal, um, it's basically a non-invasive geothermal heating device. It started inside of X, but it, it's a way to help people install geothermal heating in their own front and backyards. Chronicle is a cybersecurity company. Um, Project Loon, which is our big Wi-Fi balloons, and uh, Wing, which graduated a couple of years ago as well, is a drone delivery company. All of these projects started with small groups of people um, and teams that were, you know, one, two, three people that thought, hey, this is a really big problem in the world. Let's see if we can apply some sort of technology solution to it. And then over time grew, 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 and actually uh, graduated to become their own company. So 
we always start with the problem first, like I mentioned. Um, I think this is something that's that's really helpful to think about because it helps to narrow really what you're trying to solve instead of immediately trying to find a solution when you don't really fully understand the problem. So for Waymo, the team wanted to start with the problem of there are thousands of deaths that happen every day related to uh, cars. 94% of car automobile deaths in the United States are related to human error. Why is it that we're continually putting humans behind cars when we know that almost all of the crashes and deaths that occur are, are because of the errors that we have? So that was the problem that they initially started with. For Wing, which is our drones, with, was our drones company, the problem that that team started with was logistics. Right now, we know that, I mean, for the, you know, pre-COVID, the majority of packages that are being delivered to cities are being delivered in huge trucks that are just being clogged, clogged up the streets. Um, and simultaneously, you have people that live in really remote parts of the world that aren't able to get the packages and the goods that they need because they don't have the infrastructure to get there. So, so many carbon emissions are, are being used by delivery inside of cities with these big trucks for tiny little packages. What, what, what's wrong with that? And how can we make the, the logistics process in, that we use in the world a little bit more efficient? So that's what the problem is that they were trying to solve. For Loon, um, the problem of internet connectivity, which is you know a little bit more of a well-known problem. Almost 4 billion people in the world still don't have internet connectivity. Why is that? Um, they are really trying to look at rural places, so areas that a fiber optic cable is really difficult to dig. They basically are floating a balloon. Um, that's That entire balloon is about the size of a tennis court when it's fully inflated with um, a small set of panels at the base of it that extends the reach of existing cell phone towers on the ground to about one of those balloons can ex uh, extend the reach of a cell phone tower to about the size of the state of Rhode Island. That's the, that's the space that it'll extend to. Um, I'll, I'll tell you about one other project that is also trying to solve the problem of internet connectivity that I've been working on a lot more closely over the last couple of years. It's called Free Space Optics. Um, and if some people are familiar with this, it's actually an older technology that's been used in different um, military areas or uh, you know, in areas that are, are super remote, but nobody's really commercialized it. So it's, it's um, using laser beams to transmit internet data in places that some similar to Loon, where it's been really difficult to dig fiber optic cable. So, the team here, actually, there was a several parts of the Loon, several people from the Loon team that um, were flying the balloons in the air and they needed a way to have the balloons talk to each other in the sky. So they were they were piloting or, or testing out different types of technologies. Um, they tried free space optics for one of them and they ended up using a millimeter wave, which is a different technology, but they said, hey, actually, there's like maybe three of them inside of Loon that said, hey, actually, we're not going to use these laser beams for the balloons, but why don't we bring them down to earth and see if there's a need there? So, so literally one of the projects that we're working on right now has come from three other people that were like, wait, why don't we just do this? Um, and just gate, gate, we're given the permission to test it out. Um, one of the things that we learned really quickly on with with free space optics, uh, which is why I put up this photo here, is that testing out in the real world was so important. Um, if we had gotten friction from our leadership to, to not try this out and not experiment a little bit, there would have been so many things that we didn't learn, we wouldn't have learned until much later on. And one of those is that um, we've been piloting a technology in Andhra Pradesh, which is a state in, in, in south, southeastern part of India. And when the team was building the laser beam links in Mountain View, California, which is where we were based, they, you know, there was, they were building them on uh, poles and cell phone towers and, um, you know, everything seemed great. The minute they started deploying it down in, in Andhra, 
they were realizing that the towers were shaking a lot and and there were monkeys all over these towers that were preventing them from installing them at certain times. For most Indians, this is a very common thing that like nobody's really surprised about. Like, of course you see monkeys that are climbing on the cell phone towers. But for the team here, they were shocked and they said, how did we not know that we would have to adjust for this sway in, as the towers were shaking? because it's a line of sight technology. There's one link that goes on one tower and one link that goes on another tower that's about 20 kilometers away. And they have to be able to see each other um, with a laser that's about the size of a quarter. So you can imagine even the little bit, little bit of sway will affect how one laser beam will be able to see another. And when the team learned that the shaking was just much more of a common issue and they, didn't, they couldn't do much about it, they brought the links back and they adjusted it to alter for um, certain degrees of sway. So we're, that's just one example that I think um, is, it was, was we learned very early on that getting out into the real world and just trying something will help us learn a lot more to make the end result um, more beneficial and, and better in the next round. So a few more secrets that we've learned in the last several years that I wanted to share with this group. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this for the sake of time. Uh, the first one is focusing on 10x, not 10%. So I think a lot of people hear this um, phrase 10x thinking, and it's become a little bit more common, but we really believe it's true. And, and what it means for people that haven't heard about it before, but it basically means don't try and make little incremental improvements. If you're trying to really improve a system, you have to think about how to break the system and really think about it from um, improving it by, by 10x. There's a couple of reasons for that. One, um, sometimes incremental improvements will lead it, you'll leave a lot of the assumptions in as you're trying to solve that problem or make it better. When you think about uh, 10x thinking, you basically have to throw out all of the assumptions that you make. Um, and and really kind of start over. And so for us, you know, one of the examples that we give is if someone told you, try and build a car and it has to give you 85 miles to a gallon of gas. You'd say like, okay, that's a lot, but you know, it's a little bit more than what a, the, what the highest mileage per gallon uh, car can currently do. So you would probably take that car and tweak it and see what you can do. If someone told you, you have to make a car, but it has to be 800 miles per gallon, you'd really have to rebuild that car and think about it much more differently. So what we're trying to do is, is force people to think about it in that second way. The other reason why we think this is really important, and I've seen this a lot in our teams, is that this is much more of an inspirational way of framing uh, work to people versus you know 10x versus 10%. And, you know, the question that we often ask is like, when was the last time that you got really excited about something when someone said, hey, come work with me on this project. It's just going to make this existing thing a little bit better than what it was before versus come work with me on this project. It's going to completely change the way that we work. So we find it to be incredibly more motivating for teams. The second thing, which is what I addressed a little bit earlier, was fall in love with the problem, not the solution. Um, we hire folks that are often called, uh, often T-shaped folks. So um, what it means is that, you know, they have uh, expertise in, in that's pretty deep in one area, but they can work across various different types of expertises um, across many different areas. So, you know, we really don't think that hiring uh, very specific experts that are very much in love with the, the technology itself is helpful. We would rather instead frame projects that are focused on like, let's talk about what the problem is and then we'll figure out what the solution, what the best solution is after. The third thing is building in diverse perspectives. Um, I have a public policy and NGO background. I wasn't hired to, uh, at X because I'm an uh, expert in laser beams or self-driving cars or drones, but I was hired because I worked in public policy and government for 10 years. So inside of X, you know, we, and increasingly we have to consider this because we're based in Silicon Valley and it's, it's probably one of the least diverse places in the world. So 
for us, it's even more important to build in those diverse perspectives. Um, one, because it helps us remove some of the blind spots that we may not have thought about if it's just a very homogenous team. The other thing is that, um, you know, we found that uh, having some sort of friction inside of teams allows people to be just more honest and forthcoming as opposed to having everyone think the same and be um, more afraid to kind of speak up because it's more of sort of a group think kind of thing. So like I said, you know, we, we try to build this in as much as, as possible. Um, I come from policy background. We have people across X that come from marketing and BD and um, like probably similar to BI, different types of central teams. We also have hired people that were former fashion designers. Um, somebody that works on building the loon balloon was actually a material scientist. So she spent 10 years working on, on developing the strongest types of genes, denim for genes. She came on to Loon. We've had people that um, because the balloons eventually go down and, and after about a hundred days, they have to be, they land and they have to be collected. We actually hired a number of former forest rangers that are going on out into the field in the, the, in, in the middle of the forest of Brazil in the rainforest to basically collect some of these balloons. So very, very diverse set of uh, perspectives. So a lot of times I get to this point in this presentation and it's all sort of rosy and people in the back of their heads are thinking, you know, you work at a fancy tech company, it's in Silicon Valley, it's, it's Google, you know, you're very well resourced. Um, what happens if you fail? It may not actually, you know, like you, 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 how do you deal with the failure? Because Google had an alphabet has a really high uh, spotlight and very, um, you know, anything that happens at, at alphabet, you kind of hear about it. So for us, we've built in a few different perspectives to help us think about what happens if we actually try something and it fails. Um, and I actually think most of, almost all of these principles can be applied in your, organ in your own organization because for us, you know, it's not just about the, having the financial backing or the resources, it's about building a culture that we think enables that failure. Um, like I mentioned before, experimenting and being able to walk away from ideas that doesn't, that don't work is everything. I mean, we are constantly incentivizing people either through bonus structures or through um, like opportunities that will get them out into the field or let them work in different parts of the world to try something. And if it doesn't work, that's okay. Your job's not gonna get lost. Actually, we give out bonuses for people that um, kill their own projects because we realize that like the incentives are not designed in a, in a historical way to kill your own work. <laughs> so we're trying to sort of shift that around. We have something called um, uh, Dia, which is our version of Dia de los Muertos, which is uh, Day of the Dead, where we bring together everybody every year in our office and we talk about all of the projects that didn't make it through the process and what people really cared about us. So we give people a space to, to sort of mourn. Um, and there's several different things like that inside of our culture that I think are really helpful for being able to experiment and walk away from things. Working on the hardest problem first, that's the second one. Like I mentioned, the monkeys um, on the cell phone towers, we would have never guessed that that was an issue unless we actually went out there. A lot of times what we found, and I do this often with my, with my work, so I constantly am having to remind myself of this, is, um, and this is a, like a cheeky little analogy that we give, but if someone were to tell you, please build me, or please design me a monkey that can recite Shakespeare on a pedestal, what would you do first? Would you teach the monkey how to recite Shakespeare or would you build the pedestal? And almost always people will build that pedestal because it's the easy thing to do. You get credit for it, you build it, all of your colleagues say, wow, look at that cool pedestal that you built. Like, and you know that the hardest thing that is going to happen is actually teach to teach that monkey. And you also know that the whole thing won't work unless you teach that monkey. So why are you wasting your time doing the pedestal? Because we give small rewards for, for things that are easy problems. 
and it just feels better to do that. So what we constantly see are there are like signs everywhere at X um, that help people that help people get reminded of this. But working on the monkey first um, is something that we try to constantly remind ourselves. And the third one, and um, this is the last one that I have, and then I'll take some questions, is around embracing learning. And I think this has become a little bit of a Silicon Valley cliche, uh, like failing fast and um, embracing failure. I, I don't think people actually ever really like to fail. Like most people hate it. We all hate it. It feels terrible. I think the important thing here is to embracing the, embracing the learning is what we try to focus on. So what are the things that you've learned from a previous project or an experiment that you've tried that hasn't worked and how can you potentially uh, involve it or incorporate it into your next round of projects. The Free Space Optics laser beam project is a great example of that. You know, they were trying to use it for Loon. It didn't work up in the sky. So they said, listen, go on with something else, but let's see if we can try it down here on Earth. Uh, and I think that, that there that's obviously, you know, a, a, something that led to a really great outcome, but small there's smaller other examples of that that i can think of to try and share as well so i'll pause there um there was a lot of information but also i hope uh, information that was helpful for you all to think about how you can incorporate some of these pra uh, best practices into your own organizations and um i'm happy to answer any other questions or if people have questions about uh, my personal background, what I'm working on, or X, or anything else, I would love to hear it. Oh, and Johnny, I don't know if I can uh, hear you. Okay. Um, yes, now I can. Uh, you can hear me. Okay, great. Yeah. Oh, that was an incredible presentation. So much to learn and so much e kept echoing. You know, it naturally kept echoing. <laughs> I said, yes, 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 especially around the failure. So yes, we do have questions, Mitha. And I mean, I learned something new. Creating moonshot mindset is a new concept that I learned. So I'm sure it's the same for a lot of our audiences also. But yes, we have a question which is very interesting. So the question from the audience is, is there a project you especially felt very excited about and why? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there, were, there are a few projects that I felt very excited about. Um, one, and that there are two actually that are new X projects that we recently announced in the last few months that I didn't speak to in this presentation. But um, one is around co a computational agriculture project. So we have worked on climate change over the last several years in different forms, whether, whether it's through energy projects or um, food type projects. But increasing over the last year or two, as climate change becomes more and more of, you know, a like the forefront of um, what of, of one of our biggest problems in the world, people inside of X have really wanted to focus on it. So we're using, we're, we're taking food as the area and climate that we think we can be the most impactful on. Um, our computational agriculture project is a project that it uses machine learning to help and satellite imagery to basically help farmers better understand crop changes on the ground and how climate change is impacting everything from their soil to the plants, um, to the you know, air around their crops. So that one I love. The second one, which is a new one, is, is a similar type of idea, but for fish. So we recently announced it about a month ago, it's called Tidal, and it's a underwater sensing technology that is helping far fish farmers better understand um, how a disease is spread inside of fish farms to um, help basically optimize the amount of food that they can produce. You know, we have billions of people on this planet and it's, it's they're gonna, the population is gonna keep increasing and food scarcity is something that is going to be coming up over and over again. But a fish is actually a very sustainable way of feeding the planet. So we're looking at those two projects simultaneously right now. And those are two of my favorite ones. Great, great. One more question, which is very interesting for me too. Uh, the technology industry seem to be very open to innovation than other industry. What other industry do you think are open to innovation and entrepreneurship? Hmm. 
Um, I would say, I mean, so I think there are a few tech for sure. I think has obviously, because I think it's baked into a lot of the principles um, in the way people work day to day here. And it's just become that the Valley has become a culture over time that has allowed for more experimentation. <laughs> um, I would say, and this is maybe not um, like something that's more, that people would expect, but I think city governments are actually really good with that experimental experimentation. Federal government um, is becoming, in, in the US, I think it's becoming a little bit better, uh, but mm -hmm. I would say city governments I've seen are so close to the problems and also still have budgets to be able to experiment with things um, that it's been exciting to see, like in San Francisco, for example, we we have an incredible composting pro, uh, program for the city of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Not that many other cities do it. It started off as a, a very small experiment um, that the city tried to do, and they've done they've done different types of experiments for various populations, including the homeless population. So, uh, I would say that city governments, also um, small businesses that work in like food and kind of beverage industry, especially, you know, we're seeing right now, a lot of people are having to pivot their business models and change and sell things online, doing um, direct to consumer, um, adapting to the changing needs of and, and desires of what con consumers even want in food and beverage. So that's something that's been really interesting to witness. Great, great, great. I do have a few very important questions, I think, which will be of relevance to all learners. And then I also have some audience questions. But um, something which is um, everybody will want to know, you have a diverse experience of working with government, social, uh, social organizations and nonprofit corporates. Um, I would like to ask you, what are some of the common challenges that entrepreneurs come across? And how do you suggest they deal with it? Yep, um, that's a really good question. I've seen, I mean, from the federal government side to both local governments, to NGOs, to private sector, feels like um, even if you have a culture like X where people are incentivized to be okay with failure, most people don't really like change. And mm. that seems like that's a very, maybe that's just like a basic human behavioral sort of um, component of how we operate is once people have something that, even if it doesn't work very well, if it works sufficiently, and if they have, if it's gone through a, a process of like, it's been around for a long time, it's really hard to change people's uh, perceptions on things. I actually think even like the adoption of anything new, whether it's technology or new processes or a new organization inside of a company or anything like this, it, it really is like a human behavioral, a behavioral science mm -hmm. problem because, or a behavioral science issue yes. because you're having to have people shift um, the way that they think and oftentimes in the short term it makes their jobs maybe a little bit harder yes. so if you can I found that if you this a solution for that is is proving to people that um, their work is going to become like exponentially more impactful or ex exponentially easier once you get over that like small hump in the beginning has been um has been has been helpful it also helps to like pilot things in a really small way I think that like big change can be very scary for people and that's across any organization but if mm -hmm. you can have a tiny little proof of concept even if it's like a handful of people that are doing something different uh show mm -hmm. over the course of several months that it can be impactful mm -hmm. and then like open it up to people and make it feel like they're it's their choice and that sometimes is helpful with changing Mm, yes, I think that was very candid. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Also, <laughs> also uh, you know, this week we opened the second week module with a very good uh, saying from Albert Einstein uh, that says, like, you know, he, he says that if you have, if he had one hour to save the planet, he will um, spend 59 minutes in 
uh, dissecting the problem or defining the problem and then one minute to solve it. So how can we make sure that our ideas is actually addressing the right problem that is relevant to the organization and for the society? Yeah, well, this goes to a little bit of what I spoke to earlier, which is around putting the problem first, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think that in, in when I worked in the federal government, I saw this a lot, which was that people ha already had an idea of what they wanted to do to solve this problem without really fully understanding that problem. Um, especially with the federal government, I think it's even more difficult because you're not just building for one population or one segment of the population, you're building for, for example, we were working with um, the VA and you, you know, you're know, you building a healthcare system for veterans that are you know maybe potentially above the age of 90 that may not have internet access or tools to be able to um, do web-based sort of uh, filing of their of getting benefits. At the same time, you may have, you know, a 25 year old um, woman who is a recent college graduate and who is, is going to be deployed soon. So, mm -hmm. and from people from all across the world or all across the country that are being deployed all, all across the world. So uh, building in a diverse perspective to help define that problem was really helpful when we were working with the VA because of the variety of different types of users that would be using that 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 solution whatever we were to build so we had to create a really diverse team to help us with that and then we did a lot of user research so really just and what we also noticed there is like asking someone what they would want is very different than like just observing them and, and observing what they would do oftentimes what we say what we what we want is very different than like what we actually do in person so for us, when we were doing user research, we actually were just doing a lot of observation, of course, with consent, but observation of, of folks that were filling out forms a certain way or um, doing an online tool in a certain way. And that helped us, all of that data helped us identify what the problems were um, in that, in like the specific area that we were trying to solve and then uh, build for that. Okay, that's interesting. I think problem analysis is also very, very critical, as you rightly pointed. Um, what advice would you give to an entry level social entrepreneur? A question comes from Andrea from Romania. And actually, a lot of learners have the same question. I mean, for beginners, what advice do you have? So advice I would have for uh, entry level is Gosh, I mean, I think that you could spend a lot of time reading and researching um, about, you know, successful stories and case studies inside of organizations um, and, you know, different problems in the world. I would say the first place to start would be to really think about something that you care about, one problem that you care about a lot. Mm -hmm. And what's something that you feel like you could become a little bit of an expert in where you would understand that problem and how to, how to describe that problem to outside people. Right. Um, and then from there, you know, you'd be able to um, really try and understand what would the best solution would be. But I, I would say like, just do it as opposed to um, doing all of the like tons of research behind it. Like sometimes just, doing it and following your gut on what you would be the most excited about is, is beneficial. Great. One more question I'm going to take in interest of the time because we also have some concluding question, very important, but yes, this comes from Ra Laura Renders and she asks, how do you keep the creative environment with yourself and your team? Do you have some tips specifically on that? Uh, you said a creator's environment? How do you keep creative environment? I mean, the environment oh, creative. creative. Environment. Yes. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I would say that I found that mixing up uh, the places and the ways in which we meet has been really helpful. Um, like going on walking meetings has been helpful. I actually have found that sometimes even phone calls versus where, where you're able to walk and talk versus like a video conference where you have to be in, sitting in one place has been 
mm. allowing me to like you know sort of witness a uh, different environment and and be able to think a little bit more differently um we also set goals that are like audacious goals on our teams so mm-hmm. and uh, every quarter we'll set like an audacious goal both as an individual and as a team or a, an experiment that you want to run and then your your quarterly review um or your annual review is actually reflective of how you meet that you met that audacious goal at the, at the beginning that you were set so that's been, that was something that was, that I learned at X that was really helpful. Um, I mean, at Ashoka, one thing that we did, which I loved was um, we did annual retreats and for a global team, that was incredibly helpful to be able to like get into one space for a few days and not necessarily talk about work, um, but talk about our lives and the, the different types of things that people were experiencing and going through and really get to know somebody as a person. Sometimes when you lower the, um, the guard a little, you know, people are able to lower their guards a little bit, more honest yeah. conversations come from that. So that, I thought that was really awesome. Okay, great, great, great. Uh, we're just 10, uh, 10 minutes away from the session uh, conclusion, but we do have some two actually very important questions that I must ask you. Uh, in line with what you just said, like, you know, honesty and sincerity in conversations, how important do you think or how can networking and interpersonal communication be useful skills for entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs? Oh, I think it's everything. I actually think that the, the most helpful thing inside of a company is how you get along with other people and um and how you communicate with them i think that um you know my friendships and relationships with folks and different organizations have helped me get to a more mutual understanding of what the problem is because you trust the person and you're able to approach it with a more in a more honest um way if you know somebody and if you are able to articulate and your feelings to them. So I I have felt like those relationships are priceless and um, you're Mm -hmm. able to navigate work problems a lot better if you, if you were able to be friends and trust the people that you work with. Great. And one other very important question that I have is, do you see um, any particular trends or maybe like, you know, can you articulate two or three trends in social innovation that you see forthcoming in the business sector that is going to drive the future? Well, one thing that um, I think about a lot, especially in my role on the policy team here at X is um, the, how the, into like sort of the sectors of government and the business sector are becoming closer and closer and working closer and closer together. I think you would, if you would have asked a Silicon Valley company 10 or 15 years ago, you know, how, how do you work with the government and would you want to work with the government? The answer would be like, definitely not. Um, but I actually think we found that working with with government early on has been more beneficial because we understand the problem a lot more and um, we are able to show our partners on the ground what the technology is and just be more transparent and that sometimes will help reduce fears about the technology um, and and help people build with us as opposed to saying, no, this is a new technology that we're launching and, you know, mandating it upon communities. So I find that the separation of government and tech has increasingly become closer in a lot Mm -hmm. here, probably in a good way, I think, um, in a healthy way will be beneficial for, for individuals the most, if, if those two groups can work a little bit closer together. Great. It's incredible to learn so much from your experience, Meta. I think uh, we really need one full day to know more and more and more. But yes, <laughs> we, are, <laughs> we are coming to the end of the session. But I do have one last question for you. Uh, what okay. do you think keeps you motivated to do what you do? And do you have any parting advice for the aspiring or emerging entrepreneurs? Yeah. Um, what keeps me motivated is, I think um, the one thread in my work has been working in social impact and being able to feel like you're improving 
the world or the communities around you with the work that you're doing. Um, so for me, I mean, that's been the common thread through all of my work. And part of the reason why I wanted to come into the private industry and work at a, at a for-profit company is because I wanted to understand the incentives of different types of groups of organizations. So that way I could help translate those um, whenever I do decide to leave. So that's both my, the motivating piece and the advice that I would give is um, try to increase your experience with different types of people and organizations that are outside of yours. So that way you can help sort of bridge those gaps and um, it, and, and and as the wor world is increasingly becoming smaller and, and things like with something like climate change, the, you know, different silos mm -hmm. have to work together. Um, I think that would be a, a really beneficial skill um, that you could have. So that's both, that's bo answering both questions at once. How do you, how do you like that? Very nice and incredible, incredible. Congratulations for being a remarkable change maker. Your experience definitely has inspired several of our learners. And um, of course, we will continue to probably bring you question if you have the time through emails, if our learners still have very specific questions for you. But yes, we, um, I mean, we are going to conclude this session saying a big thank you for your time, uh, given that you have a very busy schedule. But before we sign okay. off, I'd like to remind uh, uh, everybody that next week we are going to be meeting you twice. We have a live webinar scheduled on May 8th and we have um, our first office hour on May 7th. You can find the schedules on the course platform. And last not the least, next year's, um, uh, next, uh, sorry, next week's module is going to cover strategies for advancing social innovation in your institution, which will open on Monday, 9 a.m. Eastern time. Thank you very much for joining and see you soon. Thank you, Smita. Thanks a lot. Bye everyone. Thanks so much.